Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone, in accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast over Lunenburg Public Access. And uh, tapes of the, of the uh, meetings can be seen on YouTube. And I don't think our schedule has changed. Our uh, Finance Committee meetings are scheduled to air on Channel 8, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8 a.m., Friday at 6 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday at 7 p.m. Uh, before we get started, do we have any um, open comment from the public? Okay. Um, I have a, a couple of announcements. Um, Joe McLaughlin from the uh, Lunenburg <coughs> Public Access would like to announce that they are having a, um, an open house. And that open house is scheduled for Thursday, February 26th, 7 p.m. at the T.C. Passios Room 11. And all are welcome. I also have a notice of a public hearing from the Lunenburg Planning Board. Uh, they'll be holding a public hearing on March 9th, 2015 at 6.35 p.m. Uh, here at Town Hall to amend the protective bylaw of the Town of Lunenburg by adding Section 4.0 Use Regulations, a new section entitled 4.17 Village Center District Bylaw to add to Section 3.1 entitled Types of Districts a new subsection 3.1.0 to read as follows. Village Center District in section 3.2.1 delete the words May 3rd, 2008 and substitute the words May 2nd, 2015 to amend section 4.16 registered marijuana dispensaries to correct numbering sequence and to amend the zoning map to include Village Center District. Copies are on file in the planning office. I have a letter from the Association of Town Finance Committees. The Finance Committee Handbook is now available. Um, we are a member and all members are entitled to a copy of the handbook on CD. So if anyone's interested, we can, uh, we can order a copy of that CD. Just let me know. And then finally, I have uh, the February edition of The Beacon. Any other communications from the committee? No. Okay. Um, we have a, um, an update from the town manager um, on a request to deficit spend in the snow and ice account. State law requires that if we anticipate deficit spending in our snow and ice account that uh, we can do that so long as the current year appropriation is at least equal to the prior year's appropriation and with the approval of the Finance Committee. This item was on one of your earlier agendas um, and I'm sure you can guess we have exceeded our snow and ice account without your approval so we're here to make it right this evening um, I did attach an update that I received from the Department of Public <coughs> Works at the beginning of the month I don't have an updated um, when we when we were um, the first storm that was putting us over I don't have an updated form for you this evening I can tell you that we are um, at least anticipated to exceed the snow and ice appropriation by 200,000 at this point in time um, I've certainly mentioned to the selectmen I'm not sure if I've mentioned to you before but I think once we hit 300,000 over I think we have some significant issues we have about 300,000 that's available in free cash that could be appropriated at annual town meeting to cover the snow and ice deficit but once we go over that we really would be looking um, at the stabilization fund the using that free cash is um, 
troublesome for the fiscal 16 budget because I had intended to use some of that as a funding source either to um, supplement the stabilization fund to keep it at 5% and or some capital spending. So that causes a problem in 16, but we have to address our fiscal 15 issues before we can deal with 16. So at this time, um, you know, according to this report, we were anticipating exceeding by 70,000. I think we're, we are um, at or above 200,000. The We are working with MEMA on potential reimbursement for the blizzard, the, the, the Nemo storm that happened at the end of January. I just saw something today that there is a conference call scheduled for Thursday this week, and there is a request to FEMA that all four storms be looked at by FEMA for potential reimbursement. And there's a request for us to supply data on our costs relative to um, the storm. Our, our costs relative to the, f the blizzard were actually probably less than what you would expect because of the uh, the ban, the travel ban that was in place. So it was, um, we had relatively low public safety activity. The storm was, the snow was pretty light, so it was much easier to plow. Um, but as as the winters progressed, we've gone through all of our materials, um, and, and we've had lots of overtime to deal with the road. So we are hopeful that, that FEMA would be approving some participation in all four storms, uh, but that's yet to be decided. We, at this point, have to assume that we're responsible for 100%. Um, and again, I, I think we can go up to about 300,000, but after that, it's, it's very concerning. Do we have a sense of uh, when we might hear from MEMA in, in terms of what will be reimbursed, and, and will it all be reimbursed at the same rate of 75%, or is is that also a variable? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. The, f the first conference call on looking at all four storms is, is occurring on Thursday this week. Um, you know, I don't know, Chief Sullivan, if you, if you have any updated data. We submitted the cost relative to the blizzard several weeks ago now and haven't heard anything. So I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I would imagine it... It, it will take at least a month before, from now before we have a decision. So we could potentially be at the, uh, at the end of our budget hearings before we hear anything official? Yeah. We're going to be at the end of our budget hearings before we hear much from the state, uh, maybe before we hear about health insurance. So we'll, we'll be done before we hear <laughs> a lot. Okay. Hmm. Other questions for Kerry? No, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Do I have a motion to authorize um, deficit spending in the snow and ice removal account? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Five votes in favor, none opposed. And do you have any other updates, or you want to get right into your uh, preliminary preliminary budget recommendation? I don't have any other updates. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the preliminary budget recommendation of the town manager for fiscal 2016. Okay, thank you. Um, there are handouts of the, the preliminary budget document and um, the presentation available at the back of the room. The budget document itself is online and after the meeting this evening I will post the presentation online for anybody who is interested in um, taking a look at that. To start off, I like to, um, you know, just make sure everybody is aware that we are at the beginning of the budget process 
and there are a lot of things that change. Um, we have, even though we have our town meeting set for May, when we take up our budget, because of the timetable to get ready for the budget, we have to be finished with the budget by really the end of March. And so we, we begin the process this evening, the review process, but a lot of things happen between now and when the budget goes to town meeting. And that's something that, um, that people need to be aware of because there potentially will be changes to the, to the preliminary recommendation. And what's different this year is um, because we have a new governor where the budget usually, the governor's <coughs> budget usually comes out at the end of January, it will come out either uh, the, the very end of this month or the, the, the very beginning of March. Uh, which makes it even a little more difficult to, to fit um, anything that the governor is proposing in his budget in terms of state aid into our recommendation. So in preparing the, the recommendation, I have to say, it, for me, I think this was the most difficult one. And I think maybe I set myself up for some disappointment, in that, and that's why it was difficult. But it was difficult because when the forecast was prepared, um, I, I like to think that the assumptions that I use are fairly conservative. They're probably less conservative um, the, the more I do this, and we don't really have the ability to be so conservative because everything is tight. But I, I felt like the assumptions were good. You, you probably recall that even with those assumptions, um, we had, I had identified target budgets for all of the departments. We had a slight deficit, but we did that last year, and it, it worked out well, and things um, went in our favor. And as we got through the budget process last year, we were able to close that, that deficit and essentially fund those target level budgets. And I was hopeful that we could do that again this year, and that didn't happen. So that was, that was disappointing, and it sort of left me feeling more so than ever um, that it really would be helpful as we move forward at the finance committee level and the board of selectmen level and not necessarily now but as we move into even the next budget that we talk more in the off season about what the goals of the budget are you know is is the goal really to 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 produce just produce a balanced budget because it, it felt like, this year it really felt like all it was was to produce a balanced budget. Um, or are we trying, are there specific goals that we, we are trying to accomplish? Are we trying to get to some other level of service? And if, if we're not able to get to any other level of service, maybe we should be talking more about that and, and not talking about, well, it would be nice to have this, that, or the other thing. Um, because this year it really felt like just trying to, um, to divvy out what we had available to each department so that everybody could be closer to funding the cost of their level service. And it didn't, where I thought we would start, where I thought we would start was we would be able to provide some increased level of service somewhere and that really hasn't happened. I think there's one thing that I, I will point out with our um, administrative offices and, and land use offices. I think, I think we're going to do some, some neat things there that I'm, I'm happy that we can do. We're actually doing it with less funding than we had in the current year because of some changes that we're making. But it just didn't feel like we made any progress, and I thought we would because our revenue increase is pretty decent, uh, but because some of the things that, that happened that we'll go through this evening, it just didn't happen. Um, so again, the recommendation is less than the fiscal 16 targets that were established through the forecast process. Um, in almost all cases except for non-discretionary spending where, where we don't have uh, um, the opportunity to do anything different. The recommendation is less than the original target for our public safety departments, for our public works, for our, our public schools. And that, again, was a disappointment for, for me. Um, the recommendation does fund all of our contractual salary increases. It meets our financial policies, and specifically, it meets 
a requirement to have 5% in our stabilization fund. Um, and, and it is balanced um, using recurring revenues. So we're, we're not using um, free cash or stabilization fund to fund anything. We're using our recurring revenues. So, so those are all good things. Um, the challenges in putting this recommendation together this year, first, we don't have a, a budget from the governor, so we, we don't have a, a good idea of, of where he's coming from, but I have a good feeling, but I haven't seen anything, so I had to be somewhat conservative there. We don't have a health insurance renewal, and we typically have that this year. This, at this time of year. And the reason that we don't have it this year is because Maya, our insurer, decided to put off uh, issuing renewal rates because they were trying to push out some negative claims data. They look at a 24-month period, and, and the executive board of Maya decided to push it out a couple of months to get rid of some bad data uh, on the other end to potentially give us um, a better renewal, but, there, but whatever renewal we get, and we'll talk about you know what I have in here. It's not going to be the zero that we've had for two years. Um, but the good news is we're still, even with what we're projecting, we're still paying less in health insurance than we did in fiscal 11 and fiscal 12 because of the changes that the board of selectmen has been able to negotiate with the public employee committee. So. Um, I think we're in good shape for health insurance, but when you go from a zero increase to anything, it impacts the budget. We don't have an assessment from Monty Tech. We, t we typically have a preliminary assessment. We don't. I mentioned in the budget document that I had asked a couple of times even to get um, some enrollment data to see if our enrollment was going up, and unfortunately I didn't receive that until pretty much right after I had finished putting the budget together. And we do have an exposure because we have, at least based on what I've been told, we have uh, an increase in enrollment of seven students. So that, that is something that needs to be taken into account before we, we finalize the, the budget document that will go to town meeting for um, consideration. We don't have any free cash available, and I had mentioned I had hoped that we would have something, at least that $86,000 that we need to put into the stabilization fund to keep the stabilization fund at 5%. And I don't expect that we're going to have that because of the, the trouble we have with our snow and ice budget this year. And finally, the retirement assessment that we received um, I did anticipate an increase, but I anticipated 8%, and it came in at 18.5%. And we'll talk about that um, when, when we get to that section of the budget. So I'll spend some time next talking about revenues, then I'll, I'll pause for some questions or some discussion about revenues and move into expenditures. So in terms of revenue, we have four different sources of revenue, property tax, state aid, local receipts, and available funds. Property tax is our largest revenue source. It's 67 percent of our revenue. And it's, it's higher this year if you compare this, this year to prior years because we have a, a, a big chunk of exempt debt service coming on in fiscal 16. So that's why it's higher. And we'll talk about that a little further. State aid is our second largest funding source at 20 percent, about $7.1 million. Local receipts is 8 percent, or about $2.7 million, and available funds is 5 percent at about $1.6 million. So if you compare our total anticipated revenue in fiscal 16 over last year, in total, you see a 3.41% increase. Um, there's always, when we start the budget process, our available funds number always looks significantly different than the prior year. And I think the one thing to keep in mind is that available funds, um, they're tied directly to expenditures. So available funds go up 
in a relationship with a direct expenditure. I think that the easiest way to look at it is if we, if we borrow for, to, to fund capital, that comes in as an available fund. And that's why you see a significant difference this year in, in, in 16 versus 15, because in 15 we had about a million dollars in borrowing um, for the, the fire truck and the purchase of the lane property. One other item to point out, uh, because this um, composite chart shows that, that I project state aid will go down by about 1%. But one thing to, to point out is in fiscal 15, we received the Smart Growth 40S unanticipated payment for educational expenses associated with um, the Tritown Landing Project, which is our Smart Growth Zoning uh, Project. That came in as state aid. I'm proposing to use it in fiscal 16, but it's an available fund. So if, if you back that out, you would see state aid is, is more like a 2% increase. In terms of property tax, the way that we calculate what we have available is we look at the prior year base, multiply that by 2.5%. We add in our estimate for new growth. And then we add in um, anything that was voter approved outside of the levy limit. So if we had an override proposed, we would add that in. We don't have one proposed, so that's, that's a zero. We add in debt exclusions. And I mentioned we have, um, we have borrowed at this point $30 million of our about $38 million local share of the middle school, high school project. 30, 30 million of that will come on um, to the tax rolls in fiscal 16. So the debt service associated with that $30 million, which is, again, just the local share, is $2,494,847. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's the, um, the total exempt debt. The, the exempt debt associated with the high school, middle school high school project is 1,634,755. I apologize. The other 860.092 is, is other um, exempt debt existing for the library, for the public safety building, and for the other school project. So the average, the estimated impact for um, a home of average assessed valuation as a result of the new debt coming on for the school project is $316.67. So again, the overall increase for property tax is 10.11%. 7.21% um, of that is, is the um, increase associated with the debt service for the school project. State law requires that we budget 100%. Even though we don't quite collect 100%, we, we have to budget, assume 100% collection. Uh, when we come up with our property tax. So we're looking at um, property tax levy in fiscal 2016 of $23,348,171. And I can pause here for a minute if there are any questions. I know that was a, a lot more data than you typically get when we talk about property taxes. Questions relative to property tax? No, I'm good. Or I'm, I'm sorry, just... Uh, yeah, property tax. Just one, and that's, that has to do with uh, new growth at 175,000. That's, uh, I gather, there's some upward potential in that number, correct? There is some upward potential. Um, we do have <coughs> another building at Tritown Landing that, um, depending on how quickly that moves through construction. We could see some of that coming on for fiscal 16, but it's too early. It's too early to tell. 175,000 is probably slightly higher than we would typically see without any type of um, project. Mm -hmm. But the economy is doing better. Um, people are 
making improvements to their home that they ne weren't necessarily making even a few years ago. We have seen some decent new growth. So that is an area of uh, potential increase. Carrie, in fiscal 15, um, we had an unused level a levy capacity of um, just over 201,000. Yes. Uh, could you comment on that? So that, and that, um, we've captured that in the fiscal 16 um, estimate or calculation for property tax. The unused levy capacity really had everything to do with the timing of receiving that smart growth 40s revenue it was hundred and eighty three thousand um, dollars it is money that we have attempted to apply or reimbursement that we've attempted to apply for for the last three years uh, with the state we were finally able to um, to go through that process in fiscal in the current fiscal year the application went in in September, and we were notified, I think, at the end of October that we would receive that money. Um, and because we received it and it was, it was part of our cherry sheet, we had to count that as revenue in fiscal 15, even though we didn't anticipate it. And we didn't have the opportunity to have a, a, a special town meeting, which is the only way that we can increase our appropriations. So unfortunately, because that came in at that time and it was unanticipated, um, we didn't have the ability to use that levy capacity. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this may be getting ahead just a bit, uh, but w what's the likelihood that um, will qualify for that same smart growth 40S funding in fiscal 16? Well, we definitely will apply. We have a much better understanding of the process. Um, we will definitely plan on having a fall town meeting. I, th I think this is one of the lessons learned that um, we just need to plan on having a fall town meeting. Um, the timing will be the same. We will apply in September as long as it's available and we won't know until the end of October. Um, so rather, the, my, my thought process was that um, we, received, we received that money in fiscal 15 in the current fiscal year. We know what it is. Um, it is available to be appropriated in fiscal 16 and so I'm proposing that that money be appropriated in fiscal 16 uh, because we know what it is. Uh, we can plan on it. If, if we just let it fall to free cash and we didn't do anything with it, then we're not taking advantage of funding that we have. Um, and if, if we waited to see what we, could ha what we could get in fiscal 16, then it's difficult, particularly for the schools for which this money is intended to do something, mm -hmm. because they, they have to know on September 1st what they're doing. And while I'm sure they would be able to find a use for it if they received it during the year, it probably would, wouldn't necessarily be how they wanted to use the funding. If we, two other points I wanted to make. Um, if it is available and if, if it is received and it is appropriated at a special town meeting, we really have kind of overstated what our revenue is and potentially created a bigger problem going into fiscal 17. So I think we have to keep that in mind if we essentially appropriate two years worth of 40S in, in one year, then we don't have the opportunity to use that in, in fiscal 17. The other thing is this 40S funding, there are only three communities in the state that are eligible to apply for the funding. Because, and the reason they're eligible to apply is because they have projects built under 40R zoning. Two of the three received the funding. The third community, they go. The, the state goes through a very extensive calculation where 
um, they, they want to document that your costs associated with educating students that reside in the 40R district are over the excess cost. They're, they're, the state is looking to fund the excess cost, the cost that's over and above the average spending. So one of the communities wasn't able to document that or didn't have costs that exceeded the average spending. So when I spoke with the representative at the state that works with this program, she said, that's great. There's only two of you that, that are eligible next year. If there are only two out of 351 communities in the Commonwealth that are eligible for this funding, that's a potential target for funding to be eliminated at the state level. So um, I, I think it, it certainly uh, something to think about what you would how you would recommend spending that if it came in in fiscal 16 again we certainly will apply for it but the timing is we really won't know until the end of October and we didn't this year um, we supplied the data to the state it's not we didn't fill out an application we didn't have the opportunity to um, to determine what we thought we would get the state handled all of that. And I have a, a better idea now of how they make their calculation. And I think we maybe will be able to make an estimate um, once we submit the data in September. But um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna know until at least September. <clears throat> So next, um, state aid, I've already mentioned the timing of the governor's budget, um, but, but what I think is important is that in, in his short time in office, I think the governor has shown himself to be an advocate for cities and towns. And the reason I say that is because um, while he was campaigning, one of his promises was that he would release the additional Chapter 90 that was authorized in the fiscal 15 budget, and he did that. Immediately upon taking office, he did that. Um, he immediately upon taking office was faced with a, a significant deficit in the state budget in the current fiscal year and he went on record saying that he wasn't going to balance his budget on the backs of cities and towns and while I don't believe he's resolved his budget issues um, I, he hasn't made any attempt to come after local aid or state aid um, to balance the budget and I also don't think that the, I don't see him going forward uh, proposing to cut state aid. And I also don't think that the legislature is going to cut state aid. Now, we may not see significant increases. We may see very minimal increases. But we almost always have seen an increase in Chapter 70. Um, and, and, you know, the Speaker, both the Speaker of the House and the Governor have, have been strong supporters of um, state aid. So I think um, I think we will we will do okay. What I've projected in in terms of growth in chapter 70 is 2%. That's $112,000. That's significantly less than what we've seen in prior years. Hopefully we'll see something more than that when the governor's budget comes out in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, one, one area that I hope that the governor and the legislature will take another look at is the lottery or the unrestricted general government aid. Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the amount of aid that we receive now is 30% lower than it was in fiscal 2009. There's been growth in the state lottery, the revenue that supports local aid, and there's been almost no growth in um, unrestricted general government aid. And this is, this is um, something that, that really is uh, a, a huge issue for us. And, and the reason I say it's huge is because if you inflated that revenue by 2.5%, it's over $600,000 that we've lost out of our budget. Uh, and that's, that's significant. So on this very busy chart, I've, I've shown on the left-hand side, 
it's still the left hand side for you <laughs> even though I'm facing the other way um, what what our aid state aid looks like in in category um, and below that I, I've pointed out that in fiscal 2007 22 percent of state aid was this lottery aid or the unrestricted general government aid which I still think Governor Patrick just changed the name to try to trick people so you didn't know it was lottery and it didn't need to be <laughs> increased and he could cut it and use it for something else but it, it's money from the lottery and in um, the current year that 22 percent has dropped to 13 percent and I'm projecting just a slight increase in fiscal 16 and if you look the the chart on the right hand side that just shows what our state aid in total looks over time any questions on um, state aid before I move forward so next is local receipts and I'm projecting um, some pretty significant increases in local receipts 9.65% or about two hundred and forty one thousand uh, dollars the local receipts are our motor vehicle excise our departmental revenues our permit fees um, investment income very um, there can be wide varieties depending upon what our local economy is doing the largest of our um, local receipts is motor vehicle excise tax and I am projecting a four and a half percent increase or about sixty a four and a half percent increase in fiscal 16 and the way that we look at or or gauge what what to um, project for an increase is we look at the first commitment of the calendar year for motor vehicle excise if you um, if you own a vehicle if you've owned it for more than a year most of you receive your motor vehicle excise tax in February and uh, we compare commitment one over a period of time to, to see what the increase is. And we have had in the town of Lunenburg strong increases in motor vehicle excise tax year after year after year. It means we like our cars, we like them <laughs> new, <laughs> we like more of them. Um, we've, we've really done well in motor vehicle excise. That being said, it, it's a fairly small revenue source. Um, the, the commitment was up 5.6%. I'm projecting 4.5% next year. Um, if, if you wanted to talk about increasing it slightly, each half a percent brings in $7,000. So it, it's not significant, but every little bit helps. Um, all of the other local receipts are projected to increase 2% except where noted. Um, I am projecting that depart departmental um, receipts are increased by $30,000, and this is to account for an increase in the ambulance fee schedule that was approved by the Board of Selectmen. Um, our local options meals tax are strong, but we bumped them up quite a bit in fiscal 15, <coughs> so I'm only projecting to bump them up by 2% in 16. And then the other, the other big new revenue source for us in fiscal 16 is finally the solar net metering credits. We're expecting to receive about $130,000 annually. Um, that the project, the Chase Road Solar Project, for for um, which the this money is associated, uh, has been in commercial operations since the end of July. Based on the receipts that have come in to date, 130,000 is a good number. And then available funds, um, sometimes these are one-time revenues or they're directly associated with an expense such as the reimbursement we receive from, from the state for the, um, the primary school, our water and sewer betterments, um, indirect costs or funding from the sewer enterprise fund to fund indirect costs, the costs that the general fund bears on behalf of the sewer enterprise fund. Anytime we want to recapture any exp unexpended articles, um, that, that is considered an available fund. Uh, the free cash appropriation of $183,618 to cover that um, 40S payment that we received. And then the school transportation offset fees, these are bus fees. Uh, we have been collecting them. The, um, 
legally they should be an available fund we've had them categorized as local receipts they, they need to be an available fund so we've moved them into the correct category <clears throat> again overall we're, we're looking at a 3.41 percent increase which is a million one hundred and forty nine thousand five hundred and fifty three dollars in um, fiscal 16 again state aid um, in another couple of weeks we'll have a better idea on state aid and you know depending on how we end fiscal 15 and when I say end, really how we end the winter season we may have some funding left in free cash to appropriate I'd really like to be able to at least cover that deposit into the stabilization fund because if we can't with free cash then it's just taking from other areas of the budget so that that's the summary for revenue I can take another short break for any questions related to revenue carry on the um, uh, excise tax um, how confident should we be or how cautious should <coughs> we be about your um, assumption of 4.5 percent against uh, a commitment that's 5.6 percent um, I think it's slightly more aggressive than what I've projected in the past but again the the half percent is seven thousand dollars so I think we have to keep it in perspective um, but we have done well in motor vehicle excise tax collections we've always collected more than we've estimated and we've always estimated something close to what the first commitment is for the current fiscal year our motor vehicle excise tax collections are very strong uh, because if you don't pay your motor vehicle excise tax um, you can't get your license renewed you can't get your vehicle renewed so we have a very um, you know, a very reliable collection mechanism but we have very good collections to begin with right I realize it's not a lot of money but uh, seems like five percent as an assumption would not uh, would not be overly aggressive um, other questions on the um, increase in department revenue uh, is that that's not based on on necessarily on invoicing mm -hmm. that's your estimate of what will actually be collected I know that I'm just speaking to the financial statements I know one of the, yeah. the issues that they raised was um, in collections of yeah. or uncollected fee, uncollectibles so this that estimate is based on um, new billings it, we do have a, a, a chunk of very old ambulance receipts yet to be collected that probably won't be collected that we have to figure out whether or not we're going to write off that's not factored into this okay at all so this is a, a sustainable ongoing okay. new revenue source as a result of increased fees the, the selectmen looked at the fees probably th three or four times over over a period of that many years before they were convinced that it was time to to increase fees to um, partially offset the cost of providing the service and the fee the new fee schedule that we have is very much in line if not at the low end of of what is charged for those services regionally okay thanks John, and <coughs> Carrie, on, on the available funds they bounce around a lot and yeah. it seems like it's uh, related to the borrowing so I just I don't understand that uh, that line item could you explain that to me so when we when the, the way that we budget and I might I might call the town accountant up here to to talk about this <laughs> um, the, the way that that we budget borrowing we budget a hundred percent of the funding coming in and a hundred percent of the expense okay. for budget that that's the way it's shown it's not the way that I would do it but it's the regular borrowing this is the, the uh, debt exclusion borrowing yes okay yeah. thanks so, so on on the available funds line we're not showing any borrowing for fiscal 16 right yeah so I think maybe to, to better explain it we appropriate or 
Do you want to help me out? <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll, give, I'll give her a shot. Then I have another idea if it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I don't. What, what were you going to say? The, the, the capital article has the full, the, the full amount gets appropriated. So we show. Maybe I already said that. But that wouldn't have any. No, I actually <laughs> don't, unless you have a specific question. I don't. This, okay. is, this is just my question, my indulgence, because I don't understand it. But we don't need to spend a lot of time here. I can find out later if you'd like. So the, the reason it's included in the, the prior year is we appropriate, this is for the capital, the capital budget. We authorize the full amount. We don't authorize just the annual expense associated with the debt service and the capital. So if we have a, a million dollar capital article and we're going to fund 100% with borrowing, we, appropri we appropriate and authorize a million dollars in expense. And so we appropriate and authorize a million dollars in borrowing, which is then different than the annual debt service payment. This is why I wouldn't show it this way, because I find it confusing as well. And it does make our available funds look yeah, it Weird. seems like it artificially, artificially inflates the available funds when this happens and, def and, and, and depresses it when it doesn't, so that the whole line bounces around quite a bit. But one thing I will say is, is the borrowing authorization itself has no impact on the overall process to get the tax recap certified. So it's not, it's not even considered part of the overall appropriations when we set the tax rate. Mm -hmm. It's just more of a memo field so that the Department of Revenue knows that we authorize the debt service. And then when we actually go out and borrow for the debt service, that's when the principal and interest payments become part of the overall appropriations on the recap. So what Carrie's saying is we, op we authorized a million dollars in borrowing in 2015. We didn't actually go out and and borrow for that or won't feel the effects of the principal and interest payments until 2016. So you don't have a revenue source. The revenue in the expendi expenditure amounts in 2015 would have been equal to whatever the debt service was that was authorized. So if we authorized a million, we'd have a borrowing revenue source of a million and expenditures authorized of a million. Now that we did the actual borrowing, the only thing that's going to hit the actual tax levy and be part of the appropriations are the actual debt service payments that we're making on that capital, okay. if that's any help. So, so then basically any borrowing that would be contemplated for capital expenditures in the coming year won't be reflected here until until we actually bond for whatever that project is. Which will not be part of the 2016 budget? Well, it depends when, it depends when the actual debt service is issued. But typically, I mean, what usually does happen is if we authorize borrowing in one fiscal year, it probably doesn't hit the, um, the budget and beca become part of the total appropriations on the recap until the following year because that's when we start paying back the debt that was issued. Okay. So when we, we have, I'm sure you're asking because in the capital there is a request or a suggestion that we borrow. So the way that we handle that um, is what I've proposed in capital is a three year borrowing. Um, we, would, we would borrow in fiscal 16, because we ha we, the expenditure occurs in 16, we don't have, we wouldn't have a debt service payment necessarily in fiscal 16 when we borrow. So we do three years, we would be borrowing for two years. We pay cash for the first, so we, we have that expenditure in the year, and then we borrow for, for two. And then it shows up on the sheet when? Whenever Karen puts it there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I assumed so. <laughs>
when, when we show you what the budget looks like after recap. Okay. After yeah. recap. Right. After recap. <coughs> okay. Any other questions on the revenue side? <coughs> So next we'll look at expenditures and keep in mind we at, at this very first presentation of the budget this is really kind of a high level overview of what our expenditures are. You have several meetings ahead of you where each of the departments will come in front of you and talk about in detail what's what's in their budget, what they requested, what's in their budget that I've recommended and things that are outside of their budget. So with only a couple of exceptions, this is really a, a high level overview of the expenditures. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions because we had a snow date, so I'm gonna try to incorporate, spend a little more time on a few areas to make up some what, what we lost because of the snow. But, but in terms of expenditures overall, I think it's important for people to keep in mind that we're a service provider organization and that our demand for services don't necessarily decrease because we don't have the money to pay for them. We provide services to a variety of groups and I think that's important to keep in mind um, and also that we need to focus on service levels and not impacts to any particular employees or employee groups. That this, this process is all about allocating resources for services. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we have several different types of expenditures. We don't, we don't just have an operating budget that we have to deal with. We, so we have um, an operating budget, but we have also have non-appropriated costs, which are um, things that we have to pay whether or not town meeting would choose to appropriate them or not. Uh, we have three different enterprise funds that are part of our spending um, in a, any given fiscal year, a water, sewer, and solid waste, uh, water, sewer, and solid waste enterprise funding uh, funds. And then we often have other warrant articles that have a financial impact, such as the capital uh, budget. So all of that has to be incorporated into our budgeting process. So we started the the process with the forecast, and we talked about that a little bit. The the forecast produced in in fiscal 16 a, a, a small deficit of 137,725. That may be a little different than than what you've seen because I I still continue to make some updates. But each department at the beginning of the budget process was given a target budget based upon that forecast. There have been some changes um, to either revenue or expense since the target budgets were issued, which increased that deficit from 137,725 to about 400, a deficit of about 420,000. And, and two of those changes, which really make up the, the, the lion's share of that, is the fact that we um, are not expecting to have free cash to supplement the budget and in the forecast the estimate was $230,000 and then that retirement assessment that I mentioned it's $82,000 higher than what was estimated in the forecast. Departments also have the opportunity to submit above target requests <coughs> Excuse me, and we had several departments that did in those above target requests um, totaled a million one hundred and twenty eight thousand five hundred and twelve dollars bringing the the deficit at the beginning of my review process to about one point five million dollars the above target requests were in the police department um, a request for three additional patrol officers and additional funding in the fire department um, in the original target, I had thought that we would have funding sufficient to cover 24-7 um, ambulance coverage with per diem staff. That was included in the target. That is not part of the recommended budget, um, but, but that was really an above, also an above target request. Um, in DPW, 100, almost $117,000 for additional funding in snow and ice and vehicle maintenance. And it was about 100,000 more in snow and ice and about um, 17,000 more in vehicle maintenance. <clears throat> in 
And then in Lunenburg Public Schools, an above target request of $765,217. As I mentioned previously, uh, the recommended budget, preliminary recommended budget is below target in almost all areas except non-discretionary spending. And again, that is much different than what I had originally anticipated. We really need a better connector for this. Is it there? It'll come back up in a minute. Um, the next chart is, is just, did it come up? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's magic. Um, what our spending looks um, in total, 52% of our spending is for education. That's Lunenburg Public Schools and Monty Tech. I don't put choice and charter in there. Um, I, there's probably a school of thought that the choice and charter should be in there as well because that is education spending, but it's not in there. Uh, the next biggest category is debt service at 13%, which again is higher than prior years because we, we will see in fiscal 16 um, significant uh, debt service associated with the school project. Uh, employee benefits at 10%. Uh, public safety, excuse uh, Public safety at 7%, public works at 6%. Um, our non-appropriated expenditures at 5 General government and human services at 5 and and capital at 2 So I, I then break down our expenditures in terms of non-discretionary, discretionary, and whatever you want to call the, the big chunk in the middle. I wish I had something better than less discretionary. That's what I call it. Um, it's not meant to, to say that any services are more important than others, but legally there's a hierarchy of what we have to pay for. Um, and non-discretionary, we don't, we don't have any flexibility. Uh, the less discretionary we have, more flexibility. In the discretionary, we have the most flexibility. Again, it's not meant to say that those services are less important. That's actually where we prioritize the, the discretionary spending that we have. So I think it's important to point out that, that all of those things that are discretionary, that's where the town collectively says it wants to spend, it values, these are the services that it values and will put the available funds that it has towards those services. Our non-discretionary expenditures include debt service, insurances, retirement assessment, and our cherry sheet charges. And I've highlighted that in bold because I'm going to spend a little more time on those than I typically would have to make up some ground for what we've lost in, um, with the snowstorm. But that's 27.59% of our expenditures. The next category is um, about 62% of our expenditures, and that includes education, public safety, and portions of DPW, snow and ice, vehicle maintenance facilities. And then the discretionary spending is 10.5%, and that includes um, the remaining services in the Department of Public Works, the library, the senior center, our veterans administration, and the administrative and land use offices. And again, that's highlighted because I'm going to spend just a little more time to go through that to make up um, for some lost time. But we're, we're going to spend a, some time talking about debt service because debt service is, is a big portion of our budget and it's, it's different in more of our budget in, in 16 because of the school project. We've already, we've, we've talked about um, the, the amount that's coming on for the school project, but I'd like to focus on the chart that's on the bottom. Our total debt service expenditure in fiscal 16 is $4,557,920. Of that amount, we have several dedicated revenue sources to offset certain portions of that debt service. We have taxes that we levy outside of Prop 2.5. Mm -hmm. Those are voter-approved debt authorizations. They total um, just under $2.5 million. We have sewer betterments, 
of $756,000, water betterments of $62,000, septic receipts of $10,868, bond premiums of $2,810, um, and then we have a reimbursement that we receive from the state for the primary school project of $534,198. That leaves, of that $4.55 million, $695,538 that directly impacts the general fund, the operating budget. That is the non-exempt debt that doesn't have another funding source. And you can see that that has increased over the prior year, uh, which was $565,000, because we, um, we chose to borrow for a fire truck and for the purchase of the lane property. Mm -hmm. um, we, we already went through this again. This is the impact to the average homeowner for the additional debt associated with the school project, 316 um, dollars, three hundred and sixteen dollars and sixty-seven cents. This chart is um, our existing debt service, net of the other funding sources. So I've backed out the um, the sewer betterment, water betterment, septic, um, and those types of things. So you can see the red is our exempt debt, the blue is our non-exempt debt. And this is what's been authorized. We talked last year for the first time about one possible way to fund or to find funding for roads was to um, assume that we would use, as we paid off our non-exempt debt, use that um, capacity within the budget to divert it to roads. We talked about doing that. Um, and then we also decided that we were, we were going to finance the truck and purchase the lane property. Uh, but I'd like to continue that discussion because I think, although I think we've, we've put that off a little bit, I think this is one opportunity that, that I'd like to keep in the front of your mind because I think it's, it's how we fund roads at an acceptable level and potentially provide um, some flexibility to finance for some capital items as we need to. So this chart is our non-exempt debt and I, I'm showing six years here. I have another chart we'll look at in a minute. Um, but if you look at that bottom line, the, the one that's in purple, if you were to say that in fiscal 15, that, that amount of non-exempt debt without another dedicated funding source was a reasonable amount, $544,000. And as we pay that off, we would use that capacity to divert two roads. You would see that we wouldn't have, based on the, the decisions we may have made, the borrowing decisions we've made, we don't have anything available until fiscal 19. We don't have the ability to divert any of that money to roads until fiscal 19. But beginning in fiscal 19, if we assume fiscal 15 as the, um, as the benchmark, we have $132,000 that we could put towards roads. So the next is, is a graph, and this, this graph is um, that available capacity. So as I mentioned, it's negative until we get to fiscal 19. And if we were to say that our goal, our local goal is to have a million dollars annually to fund roads, and we were to accept or agree that we receive $400,000 a year in Chapter 90, and we have $250,000 in our operating budget. That means we're funding $650,000 of our million dollar target, if it's a million dollars. And for the purposes of my presentation, it's a, it's a million dollars. 
then we don't and then and we don't have we don't reach that million dollars of funding until fiscal 23 each year we add to it and if you, if you go back in fiscal 17 we had 167,000 and then in 18 we had 12,000 more and then 19 we finally we finally reach that $350,000 so in fiscal 19 if we make no other borrowing decisions we're at a million dollars of funding for roads and we're making progress every year mm -hmm. <clears throat> until we get to that point so then in fiscal 19 if we only need three hundred and fifty thousand dollars then we have um, thirty nine thousand dollars left that we could use to fund capital if, if we wanted to do that if we use fi fiscal 15 as the benchmark the next chart assumes what if we use fiscal 16 as the benchmark and I didn't put this first because I don't think anybody feels good about the budget in fiscal 16 yet I think the um, I think the level of of debt service non-exempt debt service in fiscal 16 is probably a little higher than we would like it to be but if we use that as a, a benchmark and committed to um, to divert funds as they're paid off we would be able to reach a million dollars of spending in this my note is not in fiscal you know what we'll just leave it I'm gonna I want to update this because I used a I used a chart that's it's got a hyperlink and I think when I adjusted something else it adjusted something else here so I, I can show you this after but if we use fiscal 16 as a benchmark um, we have the ability to fund a million dollars sooner and we have the ability to borrow um, sooner but I, this chart is not reflecting what I would like it to uh, but again I think that the spending the debt service spending level for non-exempt in 16 is a little higher so maybe there's there's a happy medium between 15 and 16 that we could it, it's at. it's somewhat higher in 16 <clears throat> but it's still within the policy that we established uh, over yes. the last year it is it's well within, it's well within but um, you know we're pulling more for debt service from operations than we did in the prior year right. <clears throat> I'm annoyed because I was struggling with this chart and it kept changing and I thought I had it fixed but it is not fixed so that's um, that's that's debt service that was kind of a, a little bit more detail than we go into are, are there any questions regarding debt service before I move forward <clears throat> uh, just a just a comment to reiterate um, things improve rather significantly in fiscal 2020 and then um, even more dramatically in fiscal 2024 um, so it may take a few years but this is a problem that we can solve if we keep our eye on it and work toward this every year yeah absolutely it's a great great roadmap you know what now that i'm looking at it it is correct <laughs> if we use fiscal 15 as the base it's fiscal 23 <clears throat> where we finally have the ability to use um, some of that capacity to go to debt service and if we use fiscal 16 as the base it goes from 2023 to 2020 right okay. <clears throat> okay then the next category of non-discretionary is insurance um, there's an assumption that our general liability and workers comp insurances will increase two and a half percent and um, for two years we had a zero percent increase in both of those and last year we were able to lock in um, a, a an increase of no greater than two and a half percent so I'm assuming although we don't have the renewals yet I'm assuming we're going to see a two and a half percent increase but nothing higher than that 
I'm assuming a 5% increase in our police fire injured on duty insurance. That's something that, um, that runs higher than just our regular insurances in terms of increases. And then health insurance, I'm projecting a 7% increase. That's an increase of $111,000. Certainly much more significant than two years of zero. Um, well within what the medical trend is. Um, I think we might do a little better, but we're not going to do significantly better based on the bits and pieces of information I have from our um, health insurance advisor. But again, we will be spending less even with this 7% increase in 16 than we did in 11. Our retirement assessment, we've mentioned before, the total increase is 154000 um, significantly more than what I originally projected. It does include um, the, the full impact of one disability, one additional disability retirement and a couple of additional retirements. Fiscal 17, I think it's important to note that I expect that we will see a, uh, another significant increase in our assessment because in fiscal 17 for the first time the impact of the tutors being um, eligible for retirement is going to be reflected on our retirement um, assessment. After that, it should go down to 8%, which is the standard. That 8% includes uh, a very small portion is the administrative cost for running the system, but the lion's share is to cover the town's cost of existing um, benefits that are paid and a portion of the unfunded liability. And then when the unfunded liability goes away in 20, not 2040, but some, some 2038, you see a, a much less um, amount because at that point, all Group 1 employees, which, which um, is the, the more significant share of our retirement assessment, are on an actuarial basis fully funding their retirement. And, and then group four, which is a smaller group, our public safety fund on an actuarial basis, about 50% of their retirement. So you, as, as we move forward and we get closer to funding that unfunded liability, we shouldn't be seeing these big increases in retirement unless we're doing something locally to have an impact on that. And then next into education, um, the superintendent and school committee's recommended budget is $18,243,840. It is a 9% increase. Uh, the recommended amount in my budget is $17,398,402. It represents a 3.84% increase. Um, it is about what we were able to increase the school's budget last year. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that we're able to do about that. But if you remember back to the forecast, I had projected the target was a 4.5% four and, four and increase. So I'm disappointed that we're not there. Um, and then I've broken down where the funding comes from. 112117 from Chapter 70. Maybe Chapter 70 goes up and we're able to allocate more to the schools. 183000 from that 40S smart growth. And then local funding is uh, about the same in, in total $348,000. Um, outside of additional Chapter 70 funding, I'm not sure how to, to bridge that gap. I, I wish I had some ideas. I, I don't know what to do with that at this point. Carrie, um, just, to, just to clarify that, um, the 348000 from local funding, that's an increase in the amount of local funding that would go to the school? Yes. Yeah. And I, I wanted to point that out because I, I think it's important that people know that we're not we're not just relying on state aid to, to increase, that we're, we are contributing locally at least the same amount. And it varies from year to year, um, 
but but there is a significant local con contribution to um, to education as well. But it's it's a big gap, and there are lots of things in the superintendent recommended budget that are important to address um, educational opportunities to stay current with. Um, with the way education is provided to address class sizes. I mean, we, when the superintendent talks to you, you'll, you'll hear about the increase in class sizes. So these are all, you know, very important things, but I don't, I don't have any idea um, what to do at this point in time. And I'm hoping that, that we have some opportunities um, for some savings, maybe we'll see a little bit with health insurance, maybe we'll see a little bit more with Chapter 90, maybe we'll be able to do a little bit better with our, not Chapter 90, Chapter 70, do a little bit better with our own local receipts and be able to, to um, increase that somewhat, but not, it's a big gap. It's a bigger gap than, than what we've seen before. In terms of the Monte Tech assessment, based on the data that I received after the budget was approved, I think what I have in here is about $46,000 too low. That's significant. Um, when Monte Tech comes in and talks to you about its budget, you'll see, unless it's something different than it, than it was, they are at their um, minimum spending. So they, they don't typically ever ask their member communities for anything more than the, the community's required minimum spending. So there, re there really isn't an opportunity to, to have a whole lot of flexibility when it comes to that assessment. The police department, we're seeing a big increase in fiscal 16. It's 5.33%. It's $71,000. Um, Two, two um, things with the police department. We have, um, in fiscal 16, increased training requirements and fewer opportunities to have those tra the training done at no cost or reduced cost to the town. The state has increased the required minimum training for full-time police officers to 40 hours per year, up from 32. And it has also, effective July 1st, required that reserve officers or part-time officers have that same level of training. So that, in order to provide the funding for the uh, minimum required training, it will cost us an additional $18,500. That is, in my mind, the definition of an unfunded mandate. Um, Additionally, we've had a number of retirements in the police department, so we've seen some savings, but we also have almost all of the personnel on steps, getting to the top of their step system, but the steps in fiscal 16 are $31,000. Now, this is one of our larger departments, 14 um, full-time officers, but that's something that we're seeing in 16 that will be reduced in 17 going forward as we have those younger officers at, the, at their top step in only receiving cost of living. In the fire department, the increase is 4%, $27,000. Um, most of that increase is an additional amount to help cover the cost of additional ambulance. It's not going to, it's not enough to increase, to provide any regular um, increased level of coverage, but it's something that will allow the chief to, to be able to uh, more effectively cover weekends, cover holidays, um, any other times we have special events, it, but it's, it's not enough to, to do uh, to provide any change in service level. This increase really is funded by the increase in the ambulance receipts. So we projected the increase in the ambulance receipts at, at 30. Um, 20 of that has been allocated to ambulance coverage. Dispatch, we're looking at um, 
an increase of $7,800. The increase is in what we provide here locally, not in the assessment. The assessment, once again, um, remains at the same level as when we joined, uh, but the increase is to assist in, in funding the desk officer position. Uh, when, we went, when we transitioned to regional dispatch, we lost our 24-7 personnel. We've brought some back. We're hoping to bring, um, ideally, we'd like to have coverage 12 hours a day, Monday to Friday. And that's what this budget would allow for. We have four members in the district. We've been working with um, two or three communities, which I won't name at this point. Um, we're looking for, uh, we're looking to bring on another community that wouldn't increase our need for personnel. We have some excess capacity, unused capacity in regional dispatch. So we're looking to find a match with a community that could come in. We have three that we're working with. Um, there are actually two, two together that we could bring on that they are small enough and their load is low enough that we could bring them in uh, without increasing the assessment. The way this district is set up is the, the budget, total budget is divided by the number of members. So I'm anxiously awaiting bringing on somebody that's not going to cost us anything more but it's going to save us some money. We've been at this um, for a while now. The chiefs might feel a, a little differently but we've worked through a lot of the issues. Um, we continue to work through them. I think we're providing a good cost-effective service and I think we have enough experience that we are able to bring on some smaller communities and I'm hopeful that that is going to happen. That's not incorporated um, into this budget because I, I'm not sure when it would happen. Some of the, the um, initiatives or efficiencies that we're looking at we're still working on an regional animal control. We have a grant that we receive from MRPC. Um, we're waiting for MRPC to finish the report. MRPC has undergone some, some they had a significant loss of funding, so they're re restructuring, uh, but we're hoping to get the results of that report soon. We'd like to see something in terms of regional animal control. Our intent is to apply for that same grant for regional lockup in the spring, that should be available soon. Um, we potentially have an opportunity to have um, a towing contractor where, where we have police ordered tows that the, uh, there is a fee that the towing company pays to the municipality. That's a, an opportunity. We're, we're awaiting the review of our traffic rules and regulations by town council. With that would come an updated um, fee for, mo uh, updated schedule for motor vehicle um, fines. So we're, we're waiting for that. Um, the, the, the police chief is looking at alternative training opportunities to alternative ways to meet that um, required training rather than just sending everybody out. That's something we're looking at. And as I mentioned, looking to have another member join the regional dispatch district. In public works, uh, we're looking at uh, the same level of service in fiscal 16 the snow and ice appropriation to remain the same, a slight increase in road maintenance from 240 to 250 to be added to the about the 400 that we received from Chapter 90. We've also included $40,000 to fund um, stormwater management projects. We have uh, additional requirements for um, stormwater management activities that will likely come into play in fiscal 16, so we have to have some funding set aside to address those. Um, I mentioned the above target request for snow and ice of about 100,000 and vehicle maintenance of about 18,000. Um, there's been a slight increase in vehicle maintenance, but nothing in snow and ice. Snow and ice continues to remain a concern. You've seen this chart before. The blue line is the appropriation. The pink line is the actual expenditure. And the space in between is our snow and ice deficit. Our, at this point, our five-year average for expenditures on snow and ice is $354,539. We're appropriating $250, $260, and having um, 
you know, consistently at least $150,000 deficit year after year. So this is, this is of concern. In facilities, um, we last year consolidated costs associated with facilities into one category under public works. We specifically uh, left out the library because the utilities, um, the cost of the utilities for the library is part of the, the calculation for their required minimum spending. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that before. Some other things that we continue to look at in, in um, DPW and public facilities, performance contracting, making our buildings more energy efficient. We work with the Green Communities Task Force there and we'll continue to do so. Street lights, if I could ever get a consultant that would take on this project, I think we have an opportunity there. Maybe we just need to figure out how to do that ourselves, how to do that cost analysis ourselves. Because um, I think there's probably $20,000 there that, that we could save. Pavement management plan, we have an updated plan. Um, that's been presented both to the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen. Um, I, I think we need to talk about what our goal is, what our index goal is. What are we trying to achieve? It would be easier, you know, we say a million dollars worth of spending. Um, it would be nice to have a policy that says we are trying to, we want a pavement management index of 68. And then we know in the budget we need to fund whatever it costs to maintain 68. I think that's something that, that we should strive to do. Traffic rules and orders, the same thing. We're, we're waiting for the same document to be reviewed by um, town council. And I mentioned the, the stormwater permitting requirements and the potential to have a stormwater utility. In the library, the, the, require, the recommendation is the minimum um, required appropriation to maintain a certified library. That's $363,849. Right now I'm proposing that all of that come from the general fund. Last year, most of it came from the general fund, but the, um, the library revolving fund contributed, I believe, $8,000. I don't have that assumed here. I think we should talk to um, consider that as a potential, that we would look to the revolving fund to cover um, that amount again this year. And then finally, in the administration and land use offices, if there's one, one thing that I think is really positive about this budget is we're looking at a slightly increased level of spending in fiscal 16, but I think we're gonna do uh, a lot of good things. I think the, both the administrative and land use offices are lean and they're mean and I think we're going to be a little leaner and better in fiscal 16 because of some changes that we've made. In the current year, uh, we implemented the position of land use director and I think that that has been very positive um, and I think it will continue to be positive. I know the staff from a staff, uh, individual staff members have expressed to me that they're very happy with how that, that is working. And I think we need to build on that success. Um, I'm letting go of the notion of having a human resources director. I think for a variety of reasons, um, it's not gonna work. And I think if we had one, I'd still have people coming to me. We're small, you know, so I don't think it, it, I don't think it makes sense to do that. Instead, I'm looking at reassigning some, some of the tasks to our payroll and benefits coordinator who has some, uh, isn't really just an outstanding employee and has been able to, um, to make efficiencies in, in her processes and she has the ability to take on the role of risk manager and I think that this is important. Um, and, and by risk manager, some of the things I'm looking at is that we need to have somebody who has on a day-to-day -day basis or certainly a more regular basis than we've had in the past direct oversight and management of our insurance policies. We have our insurances through Maya. We have lots of opportunities to get credits throughout the year on our um, insurance policies, but we have to have somebody who is going to take that project on and identify training opportunities or activities that we can do locally to obtain those credits. That's something that this person will do. 
Um, also, implement risk management initiatives that are identified in our annual audit. We talked about this recently. You receive the audit from the, the, um, our outside auditor. We went through the uh, management letter in detail. You might recall that there were some risk management activities that we could do to enhance our operations. And I think the benefit, in addition to the benefits of having a tighter organization, um, reducing opportunities for fraud or theft, not that that's been a huge problem, but it's something we need to, to stay on top of. The credit rating agency likes to see us undertake risk management activities, and we need to do everything we can to maintain our credit rating. So I think that's, that's a great opportunity. And then to, to be available to conduct um, reviews of operations or departments under my direction to assure legal compliance, to assure that we're following best practices. The second thing that, that, we're, that I'm looking to do is to assign the role of finance director or finance coordinator to the town accountant. I don't want to get hung up on titles. Um, looking to, um, to create a resource for the organization. As finance director um, or coordinator, whatever sits better with people, this, the town accountant would be responsible for being the team leader for the finance offices, which I think for the most part she does, um, but she would be responsible for resolving issues and implementing work process efficiencies. We've done a number of things over the years um, to improve and, and make our processes more efficient. And I think there are other things that we can do if we have um, somebody dedicated to doing that. Also to assume a more active role with both the Finance Committee and the Capital Planning Committee. And then lastly, to assist departments in preparing a higher level budgetary analysis or cost benefit analysis. I think our departments are very small. The department heads are doing a number of things. Um, many places you have budget people within your organization. And just because your organization is small, it doesn't mean your budget is any less complex. It's smaller, but it's still complex. And I think more and more we need to be able to provide um, department heads a resource in doing some of this analysis because it's a lot to ask um, any of the department heads to to run their operation, manage their budget, do all of this analysis that, that decision makers need. It would be nice to have somebody who's doing this on a regular basis be available. And then lastly, um, upgrading the position of administrative assistant to executive assistant in the, um, the selectman's office have this person responsible for a number of activities, um, not the least of which is the selectmen's agendas, the agenda packets, and the minutes. Um, this is something that with the, the reduction that was made several years ago from a, a two-person, a three-person office to a two-person office, something that I have taken on, um, I need to give to somebody so that I can be more available to departments. Um, to assist as well. The capital budget, you've heard from the Capital Planning Committee what their recommendation is. Um, it's restated in here. I've taken their recommendation. I've implemented their recommendation uh, with, the, with the exception of um, taking two items and funding them through a three-year borrowing because we don't have the cash available to pay for those items. And they are the, um, the six-wheel dump truck, which is the second item, and the street sweeper, which is the, which is the last item. We're looking at level funding, our solid waste. Um, the component that's within the general fund that pays for recycling and some of the specialized programs that we offer. Our non-appropriated costs, um, regional transit assessments. One thing that I would like to mention is uh, initiative, an initiative that the Board of Selectmen will be implementing yet this fiscal year. We pay two regional transit assessments, one to the um, 
to MART, the Massachusetts Regional Transit Authority. We also pay an assessment to the MBTA. You may wonder why we pay the assessment to the MBTA. We pay it for the, benef for for the benefit of being a community adjacent to a community that has commuter rail. Did that make sense? <laughs> um, we pay about the same to each. So we get a direct service from MART and we get an indirect service from the MBTA. Under state law, we can divert that MBTA assessment to our local regional transit authority if we're increasing our service level. We can't use it to pay our current assessment, but to increase service. The, um, the Board of Selectmen is working on a proposal that would provide um, daily service to connect from the town center, the senior center, town hall, and um, Emerald Place, the CVS, Whalem, to additional, um, additional routes throughout the day, but also to connect to meet the commuter rail in Fitchburg. So one early morning and one in the evening. So we're, we're looking at using that money to provide what I think is a, one of the best things that we've done in the last few years is uh, additional reg um, public transportation. This category also is our um, tuition assessments. And we've talked before that we've, we've got some work to do to understand our choice tuition assessment in particular. Um, and we're not there yet, and I think this is a potential, expo it's a potential exposure. It, it's actually a real exposure in fiscal 15 and um, likely a, a fairly large exposure, larger than what we have projected in this budget. But until we fully understand what's going on, which we have to do in short order, we don't, um, I'm projecting just typical increases here. So um, in conclusion, it's been a, a difficult budget process. It's not what I expected. Uh, on the positive, it fully funds our contractual obligations. It uses only recurring revenues to fund the budget, maintains level service at fiscal 15 levels to the greatest extent possible. But it, it's not the, the service levels. The service levels that we're maintaining are not what the department heads are recommending for their departments. And I, I don't think it, it's what it's meeting the service demands. I don't think it's meeting residents' expectations. Um, and I think it's just, it's important to say that. Um, that it's not, it's not what the departments are asking for and not necessarily what, what residents are demanding. I, I mentioned a few things, educational op offerings, class size, we're seeing increase in class sizes. Um, again, in public safety, we have both chiefs requesting additional personnel. Road maintenance, we're not, we're not meeting our need there. So those are some examples of how I don't think that, that the budget that we're able to provide, while it's balanced, it's not what department heads would request and it, it's not what people are looking for. Hopefully the governor's budget will bring some good news. You will begin your process Thursday. Um, I think the governor's budget will be out around March 1st. The House Ways and Means budget is not gonna be out until the end of um, April, that's not going to be of any help to the process you're going through here. It, it um, may mean, if it's significantly different than the governor's budget, it may mean that um, the budget that you recommend, that the selectmen recommend, that gets printed in the warrant is not the budget that gets taken up at town meeting. It may mean that we're going to um, approve a budget knowing we're gonna to have to have a budget adjustment and a fall town meeting if there's a significant difference in um, the, the governor's budget and what comes out of House Ways and Means. And then the Senate budget will not even be out until the end of May. So unless there is a, um, a consensus revenue figure, which I don't think is going to be out in any time to help you, I, I think we're, you know, we're going to have some work to do come fall town meeting. And then I've just put your schedule up on, on Thursday. 
which is your next meeting. Uh, you, you, have, um, you will hear from the police chief and the fire chief. And then every Thursday thereafter through the end of March, you have um, hearings with departments. We have a couple that we need to, to plug in. Council on Aging and Monty Tech still need to be plugged in. But other than that, that's the schedule um, that was set at the beginning of the process. So with that, I'm out of voice and con concluding the presentation. Uh, mm. Just uh, one comment and question for me. First of all, um, thank you very much for um, a very clear and well-articulated uh, budget presentation. Thank you to all the department heads that helped pull all this information together. Um, clearly, uh, we don't have the revenue that we need to meet the service levels that, uh, that, that we'd like to see. So we will continue to be faced with, uh, with trade-offs that, that we need to make very carefully. We'll be listening very intently as we go through the various uh, budget details uh, to better understand what those trade-offs are and, and help make our recommendations um, based on that. Um, the, the one question that I would have, Kerry, is with respect to the regional dispatch. Um, I know we won't likely have an, an, a, a new member on board uh, for the beginning of the fiscal year, but is there a chance that we may have a new member on board, say, for t fall town meeting? And might that be um, something of an opportunity? I think um, I think that would be a bit aggressive. Um, I know you know for the benefit of the the other members. I I was asked today to attend a meeting on Thursday night with two of the communities that have just completed a feasibility study with the state to look at joining our regional district. They, they also looked at their own regional district, which was a requirement that they had locally. These two communities, from what I've heard, are very interested in joining. Um, I think I'll have a better sense after the meeting on um, Thursday. It is a public meeting, so it's not a secret, but it's not my news to share, so I'm not, I'm not going to. So I think I can update you even at your next meeting about what the possibility is. I think if they were to agree now, September 1 would still be a little aggressive. Thank you. Other questions for Kerry? <clears throat> I would just have a question on that. that I it's my understanding that if that was to happen with regional dispatch that those funds available is it still the plan that that would those funds would become available to um, for objectives in the public safety budget or it would just be you would just be looking at it as general well un unless I have some other directive my thought would be public safety well, I knew that that was a stated goal in the past. I wasn't sure if that was still. Well, yeah, and I think it's my stated goal, okay. right, for, for what that's worth, because I'm not the policymaker here. Um, but that, that would be my recommendation. But I, I think um, that's a good discussion to have, because I think it is a likely possibility, if it's not sometime in 16, that for the beginning of 17, that um, we would have another member and we would have a um, amount of funding available. So I think it, it would be good to have that discussion in advance, even outside of budget. Does it make sense to, um, should that go to public safety or should it go somewhere else? Anyone else? Just an appreciation. Thank you very much. Very clear, very concise, and uh, learned well, a lot. I don't know if it was concise, but I don't know that anybody on this side of the room would agree with you that it was concise. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I'll have questions tomorrow morning after I sleep on it. Well, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Kerry, thank you very much. Yes, thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Next item on our agenda is uh, to review minutes. Um, John, I think we have some minutes 
ready to review, is that right? Yep. From the January 22nd meeting. I circulated it, uh, gosh. You circulated it twice? <laughs> yeah. It's been on the agenda now for. It's been, yes. It's, it, th th this is aged well. <laughs> Um, I know I was able to read the um, the minutes in advance. Um, I didn't have any any changes. Anyone anyone else? Jay actually Jay actually flagged one. I had mis I, I, I had misidentified. I had used FY15 when I should have used F, FY16 on page two. Okay. So I got it changed. Okay. Any other? Discussion on the minutes from January 22nd. No. Thanks again. Mm, do you want me to make a motion to approve or do you need one? Uh, yeah, motion to approve. Yes. Motion to approve the minutes of January 22nd. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Okay. None opposed. Department updates. Uh, capital planning. Capital planning, I uh, can't add anything to what uh, Carrie said a few minutes ago. We have, uh, we D have. DPW, I have a meeting with uh, Jack on uh, Friday at 8.15 to talk to over, review his uh, FY16 budget and his proposal and any other issues that surface. Uh, PAC is gonna be uh, a meeting tomorrow uh, evening and I'm gonna, we're gonna review the expenses. That's a meeting that also was uh, postponed a couple of times because of weather. And uh, just the, the only other thing, just to fill in uh, uh, the library, uh, Martha Moore is in fact back. I haven't seen her, but she's uh, been, uh, been, been emailing back and forth regarding that the library is, uh, the uh, DPW and other service workers have in fact, uh, I've done an awful lot of cleaning, drying out of carpets, uh, dehumidifying, uh, treating for mold and mildew. Uh, the only snafu this week was that, of course, the main, the water main, the library froze because of the cold weather. And uh, but but the DPW is able to thaw it out fairly, or is able to thaw it out fairly quickly. They expected the insurance adjustment in today, in, insurance adjuster in today, but I don't know anything about what's happened there. And uh, they're working, they meaning the library staff is working on drying out and salvaging what books they can. Uh, the library is also gonna be open starting on Monday, March 2nd, abbreviated schedule, uh, mainly for pickup and returns. That is, you go in the library, they'll have some, uh, so, so, some, some tape there to, to, to channel people directly to the uh, to, to, to the circulation desk to pick up any uh, books and the people or, or to return books. Uh, that's going to that's going to be open Mondays and Tuesdays and Saturdays 10 to 12 and then Tuesdays again 6 to 8. Details on the website. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Terry, public safety. Actually, I, I feel really badly. Um, I lost track of where we were in time with um, all of the delays. And I wasn't even thinking that they were up this week for the budget presentations until Chief Sullivan sent me his budget presentation to review. Um, and so I've, been, I've heard from both chiefs at this point um, and been in touch with them about their presentations for Thursday night. Um, and there's nothing new other than that to report. They'll certainly, they have a lot of information they're coming in with. Um, and I think we're pretty much aware of where those discussions are going to go based on other presentations. So. And certainly uh, getting better insight into the uh, budget challenge uh, as we heard tonight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jay? Uh, let's see. Sewer commissions work on their budget. Uh, it says it looks like they're going to be able to put about 70000 back into the operating budget. And everything else is moving along. That was about the that was about the biggest, uh, the only thing. And then green communities. I'm trying to. They're moving forward with exterior lighting in both the library and the public safety. And next up is lights at the Eagle House. 
And that's all coming and from the uh, grant money? Uh, he didn't say, but I would assume so. And they um, they haven't met since the last meeting, and they don't have an, another meeting scheduled yet. So, okay, thank you, Cameron. I have nothing to report on either. The school committee does meet tomorrow. They haven't met since our last meeting, and I have not touched base with Money Tech. Okay, Caroline's not with us. Um, School building committee met on um, February 11th, and the meeting was actually at the construction trailer and began with a walkthrough of the uh, construction site. Um, I was unfortunately a little late to the meeting, so I missed the walkthrough. Um, but uh, what was reported is the, uh, the progress. Uh, there's temporary walls and heating installed in building A. So it actually looks like a building at this point. Uh, doesn't look like what it's gonna be when it's finished, but temporary walls, temporary heating so that they can uh, begin working in the interior. Um, steel work is uh, essentially complete in area B and steel work continues in area C. They haven't been able to start the steel work in area D as yet. Um, they've been set back about two weeks um, due to the weather. Uh, every day they're clearing snow. Uh, they, had a, uh, they had some photos of uh, snow blowing snow off the roof of building A mm -hmm. uh, as an example. Um, one of the things that we talked about was having a topping off ceremony it's um, traditional that when, when the last girder is uh, installed in the building um, to hoist a, uh, an American flag or a pine tree mm -hmm. uh, to the highest point in the building and to celebrate with um, the local community, perhaps the students. Uh, it's, it's a major milestone in the construction of a of building of that sort. Um, we talked about that taking place in mid-April. Nice. Um, uh, some of it is symbolic, but um, it's a good excuse to uh, bring the community together and have them see the progress and, and participate in uh, celebrating our success. One of the things we're trying to do as part of that is have a, a girder available to be signed oh. by students. And the hope is to get all the grades to participate in having an opportunity to sign the girder. Uh, probably won't be able to display the signed <laughs> girder, but um, it would be preserved for uh, prosperity. And then uh, one final announcement, our um, owner's project manager, JLA, Jocelyn, uh, J Jocelyn Lesser Associates, uh, has been acquired by a company uh, called NB5. And so they'll be joining forces with a, uh, with a somewhat larger outfit. Um, nothing is expected to change with respect to our project. The same people are gonna be on the project. Project's gonna be managed in the same way. Um, but JLA is now part of um, an, another company. And that's my report. Uh, building reuse, I'm sorry, just one more. Uh, building reuse, we're scheduled to meet first Monday in March. We're looking to reschedule that meeting. Um, I believe we're uh, hoping for March 18th. <coughs> yes, John. Uh, just on the contingency, I was kind of concerned about the weather and whether the weather had, in fact, chewed into some of the contingency on the school project. Um, it, None of the contingency from a dollar's standpoint. There's no, well, time is money. Yep, to the yep, extent yep. that time is money, we, we have lost about two weeks. Yep. Um, but we've been, been encouraged by Shaman, uh, who's the construction manager, mm -hmm. uh, that if, um, if we don't continue to experience inclement weather, they can make up that time. Wonderful. Okay, so still, it's good that way. Yes, it's promising. Great. Thanks. Yep. 
and uh, budget opportunities. Obviously, we're in the middle of the budget season, so I think we can forego that agenda item. Um, I do want to review the um, upcoming meeting schedule. Um, we have our regularly scheduled meeting on Thursday, the 26th. We'll be receiving the uh, departmental budget updates from police and fire. Um, March 5th is a special meeting. Um, as of now, uh, we hope to hear from the library and Lunenburg Public Schools. We may also try to fit, fit in the uh, Council on Aging at that meeting. And then um, the next meeting I've put on the agenda here is our next regular meeting, which will be March 12th. And as of now, it looks like Sewer Enterprise and DPW. Are we so, gonna fit land use back in? Um, I, I think the expectation was that we covered enough of land use this That's evening. I was thinking, okay. Yeah. We didn't get into a lot of detail there, but um, I don't, I don't think we'll be okay. having a special uh, presentation from them. Okay. Any other comments from the committee before we close? No, that was enough. <laughs> okay. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. And the timekeeper of record. What's the